Good evening, everyone. I'm Louise Mirror, President and CEO of the New York Historical Society, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you back to the History Hour, a live virtual program presented each Thursday evening exclusively for members and other supporters of the New York Historical Society. I hope you're safe and healthy as you watch this program this evening and that we will see you back on Central Park West just as soon as it is safe for us to reopen our doors. I wanna take a moment to thank all of our trustees, our Chairman's Council members, and all of our members and other donors for your great generosity. We can only continue to make history matter with your ongoing support. Now I know there are very many important causes vying for your philanthropy these days, so that makes us doubly grateful to count you as part of our family. For those of you who are joining us for the first time this evening, let me just take a moment to introduce our speakers. Valerie Paley, who will be moderating, moderating this evening's program, is a Senior Vice President and Chief Historian at New York Historical. She's also the Director of our Center for Women's History. Harold Holzer is the author, co-author, and editor of more than 50 books on Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War era, including the Civil War in 50 Objects, which was a New York historical exhibition back in 2013. We are grateful indeed to Harold for lending us his time this evening. Tonight's program will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers your questions can be submitted via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. In the interest of simplicity, we've disabled the chat function, so please do remember to use the Q&A. Valerie will get you as many questions as time allows. Tonight's program will be recorded so that we may present an encore performance in the future. And now I turn it over to Valerie and Harold. Please enjoy, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next Thursday evening. Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, I have to unmute. Um, and uh, good evening, everyone. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak with my good friend and professional colleague, Harold Helser. And as Louise said, before we get uh, going, I want to remind you that you can ask questions uh, throughout the program, and we'll get to as many as we can uh, toward the end. So now I would like to turn our attention to uh, some objects that help us describe the Civil War. As a curator in the museum realm, particularly the History Museum, I uh, am always struck by how art, objects, documents on display have the power to stand in for larger historical narratives, conveying so much more than what they structurally are defined by in the object in and of itself. So for those of you who missed last week's program, let's talk for a moment about this book, The Civil War and 50 Objects. How did it come about and how effective do you think it is, Harold, at conveying the narrative sweep of the Civil War in only 50 objects? Well, it, uh, it came about, as I confessed last week, because uh, Louise Mirror asked me to, uh, to undertake the project for the Historical Society. It was a lucky day for me. And you remember that we got to see, I don't know, three times 50 objects uh, arrayed before us on some conference tables in the Historical Society. So it was a matter of picking representative objects, exciting objects, which, as you say, stand in for the, the big history of the Civil War, item by item, personal story by personal story. And it was remarkable at the end that um, we constructed the history of the war from the abolitionist movement to the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. Great. And it was great fun to work with you on that project, too. <laughs> I feel the same. Uh, yeah. So uh, our topic this evening is Fighting Slavery, The Bumpy Road to Black Freedom. We will be this evening working at three objects that speak to the topic. Um, and they're all paper-based objects. Uh, an 1862 uh, petition to Abraham Lincoln for the recruitment of black troops. Um, an 1863 broadside by Frederick Douglass. And a very small sketch uh, of the arrival of Jefferson Davis's slaves to Chickasaw Bayou. So there are our objects. And uh, let's go to the slide of our first one, a petition to Abraham Lincoln for the recruitment of black troops. 
This thing is addressed to His Excellency Abraham Lincoln and bears a number of signatures. What is it, Harold? Um, it sure does bear a number of signatures, hundreds and hundreds of uh, signatures. Um, so it is a petition that was uh, a brainchild of someone named J.E. Gardner. We don't know much about uh, J.E. Gardner, except that he organized this effort to call on the President of the United States in July of 1862 to unleash the power of African Americans who, until this point, had not been permitted to volunteer for the Union Army and who constituted uh, what some people called a sable arm that could help the Union win the war by increasing its, its manpower exponentially. Um, the, this, it, we've seen this object. It's, it's, a, it's a scroll. It's a big scroll. Um, it's 25 never been, feet or something? 25 feet long. It's never been exhibited altogether because you need two floors even of the majestic galleries of the Historical Society to, to give it the full justice. And it's, it's signed by an amazing group of supporters of black enlistment for the time. Um, it's, it's signed by, clearly by Irish Americans, by, by Jewish Americans, by German Americans, um, people from all walks of life. And you can tell from their addresses, which are inserted as if it's a, a nominating petition for a public office, that it runs the gamut. And it, and it also has quite a few famous names, um, uh, important names in New York, Vanderbilt's and Whitney's and Dodge's and Phelps's all signing on to this idea that the, the Union should accept black troops, which it had not done for the first year of the Civil War. There was also one John Brown who signed it too, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. It's got a, I think it probably has a few um, fake names in there. Who could resist a little graffiti? So John <laughs> Brown, whom we discussed last <laughs> week uh, with an authentic object, uh, even though he had been dead for three years, he signed the petition. And it said John Brown of Harper's <laughs> Ferry. It was, it was very funny. Um, so I have a question about Lincoln, though. This is your subject area for sure. Why was he reluctant to accept blacks into service? So it's hard to imagine, but the notion uh, of African Americans bearing arms was frightening to many white Americans. Uh, especially in the border states like uh, Kentucky and Maryland and Delaware that had not seceded from the Union, but where slavery was still legal and would be legal throughout the Civil War. Lincoln thought that if he um, encouraged African Americans to join the service, that those border states would leave the Union and join the Confederacy. Uh, the ironic thing about this is that this, this petition is dated July uh, 20th. So let's assume the best of circumstances it got to the White House, or a version of it, as we, we get to discuss, got to the White House two, two days later. On that very day, Lincoln told his cabinet that he wanted to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. He was not ready to deal with the issue of black troops, but he was ready to free the, Afro the enslaved people in the Confederate states. And that day... Even with the petition in the White House, his cabinet, almost to a man, advised him that it was too soon to issue an emancipation proclamation. So these New Yorkers were ahead of the curve and ahead of public opinion in the White House, in the cabinet, in Congress, except for the really advanced abolitionists. Uh, so it's a point of pride for New York. Of course. New York always first. <laughs> New York uh, first. But, but they didn't send this whole scroll to the White House. They sent a highlight reel, um, which is good because you want to get the president's attention. So the, the, the short version exists in the Lincoln papers, meaning it was preserved by his staff, but he never replied to it. He just put it aside, probably because he knew he was about to embark on his own journey toward freedom and ultimately within six months toward black recruitment. Exactly. Uh, Georgia's Howell Cobb, the president of the Confederate Provisional Congress, predicted that the idea of black recruitment was destined to fail. Uh, he warned, uh, if slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong. Uh, and of course, you say by war's end. 
three years later, Jefferson Davis, in a desperate move to save the foundering Confederacy, would offer uh, freedom to enslaved people who took up arms against the Union. Surpri not surprisingly, he got no takers because his war had been predicated on the idea that enslaved that African Americans deserve to remain enslaved people forever. Right. Um, so in the story of this petition, our object, Frederick Douglass makes an appearance. He chides Lincoln at that moment, summer of 1862, for using blacks as laborers as opposed to soldiers. He called out Lincoln for suffering from a, quote, fatal incapacity to do better, um, which is interesting. He's very, very forceful in that regard. Yeah. Um, but as you said, on January 1st, uh, 1863, Lincoln issues the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation. And how does this change the narrative of African Americans in military service? It changes it uh, with uh, the, these anomalous sentences in the proclamation. One of the sentences uh, says, I, um, I admonish all enslaved people not to turn to violence against their masters. Then in the very next sentence, Lincoln says, I encourage African Americans to join the military service. So, I mean, if you do join the military service, you're obviously going to take up arms against your former owners, but that was the prevailing uh, message. So it encouraged, and then within a month or two, Congress passed a law authorizing the military services to um, accept African Americans in service. Now, African Americans had been in the Navy for decades as laborers, but and they had, as you mentioned, some had been employed um, in the Union Army as Teamsters, uh, but the idea of their bearing arms uh, was new. And um, not all the military leaders embraced the idea. For those who may be watching the Grant miniseries on the History Channel, um, in episode two, Ulysses S. Grant watches an African-American laborer take a gun and, and, uh, and shoot a Confederate when they when its owner is shot dead first, its white soldier. And uh, you see in Grant's eyes, oh, this is, this is the way of the future. In fact, Grant did not think it was a great idea at first to welcome African-Americans into his army. Uh, his chief lieutenant, William Sherman, didn't like the idea. Um, General Burnside, uh, who wasn't taken as seriously as those two by that time, uh, did not like the idea. And General McClellan, whom we saw in a tent with Lincoln uh, in October 62, so four months after that petition, basically told Lincoln, my soldiers are going to fight to restore the Union, but don't expect us to fight for black freedom because it's not going to happen, which shows you how long a road had to be marched to get the country and the military. The racist military, they, they were pretty racist too, to that point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh so, and as you said, uh, Frederick say, Douglass helps. Yeah, and and here and he uh, is uh, very much a part of our second object, uh, a recruitment broadside written by Douglass. Um, can we see the image of that, please? So, what was this the significance of this broadside, and where did it first appear? Uh, so, Douglass at this point has a uh, monthly newspaper, Douglass's Monthly which is always a little bit behind the times. You know, he, he's admonishing Lincoln in his September issue, September 62, even as Lincoln issues the preliminary proclamation. So um, it's hard to have a monthly paper. I used to uh, edit a weekly paper. It was hard to keep up with, uh, to be au courant on a weekly basis. Monthlies are, are really tough. So he wrote an editorial uh, around the same time as the petition appeared. Time for... African-American troops to be recruited into the Union Army. When the proclamation comes out um, uh, and Congress does the authorizing for black enlistment, Douglas is encouraged by several abolitionist leaders to really hit the road and orate as only he could persuasively, magnificently, to get African-Americans to enlist. And so he turned his editorial into a broadside, which is a one-page sheet. Most of them were you know, just pasted to walls or distributed to people. So it's kind of a remarkable thing that the New York Historical Society owns such a good copy. 
and when, well, when we wrote the book, I don't know if you remember, but we, we dated its acquisition to just about the time it was issued. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Which is <laughs> typical forget. of New York historical. It is typical, yeah. right? In the same way yes. we collected um, um, objects relating to 9-11 and, and objects relating to the COVID pandemic now. The New York Historical Society is kind of a contemporary museum. It makes sure it keeps the record of what will be history down the road. So this this document, um, you know, it, it's got some great lines in it, as only Douglas can write. Liberty won by white men alone would lack half its luster. Who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Better even to die free than to live as slaves. And did it have an impact? Absolutely. By, by war's end, almost 200,000 men of color had joined the Union Army. Um, and it was not um, easy. They were not treated as equal soldiers at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. They were relegated to all black units. Their officers were almost to a person white. Um, and yet, it's important to note, and also, by the way, they were not treated as prisoners of war when captured. The Confederacy threatened and did put them back into slavery or execute after they had thrown down the arms. So it was a miserable service. And not surprisingly, the casualty rate among African-American soldiers was higher than that among white soldiers. Can we just see the image of, of Frederick Douglass, the frontis of one of his uh, great books, just to, to get a, a, a sense of the, uh, the, the, the sort of towering presence of this great uh, intellectual. Um, he, uh, he was just an uh, unprecedentedly important uh, African-American, an uh, abolitionist, reformer, orator, statesman, everything else. So having uh, uh, his opinion on this matter is extremely uh, valuable um, to the, the recruitment cause. And what an imposing guy. And by the way, um, as historians have proven in recent years, he was just about the most photographed American of his time, white or black. He made sure he was photographed almost every time he hit out on the lecture circuit. And you could see what a great looking man he was. And this is uh, eight years before the, uh, the broadside, but uh, too often we see him portrayed as a white-haired old man. And in fact, he was still a vigorous, younger, youngish man during during the Civil War. And um, soon after that broadside, he had his first visit to the White House and spent his time with Lincoln, imploring him to equalize the pay between white and black soldiers. White soldiers not only earned more money, but they got a bonus to buy uniforms whereas black soldiers got money docked from their pay to buy uniforms. And Lincoln, all Lincoln, I mean, Lincoln was very cautious and worried about white public opinion um, with the recruitment of African Americans. And he simply told Douglas, the day will come, uh, but please be patient. And it was the beginning uh, of their, what became a very close relationship between Abraham Lincoln and Fred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, extraordinary. So, uh, so rounding out, we're, uh, we have maybe 10 more minutes of this conversation before we open it to Q&A. Uh, rounding out our trio of objects, uh, this evening is uh, very small. Uh, it's like nine inches by 13 inches. Uh, on the spot sketch by uh, one Frederick B. Shell, who's a special artist for Frank Leslie's illustrated paper. Uh, can right. you see that object, please? Uh, it's coming. <laughs> so. This, there it is. It, it inspired no major headlines uh, at the time, but it is historically important, and it, it was important enough to be one of the 50 objects in the book. Um, why? Tell us about this. Okay. And I will just finish the Douglas part by saying um, um, Douglas's encouragement for black recruitment um, included uh, the raising of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment which achieved immortality at Battery Wagner in July. And his own son joined that unit. Um, and they were killed in horrendous uh, numbers. And folks will remember that story from the movie Glory, which uh, was a pretty extraordinary Civil War movie. 
So, yes, there are some African Americans who are free African Americans who join the army. But when the emancipation is issued, there are also African Americans who are still in servitude um, and don't know quite how to deal with their legal freedom or may not have heard about their legal freedom. Um, one of the great mysteries of the Civil War is how news of the proclamation spread to uh, uh, enslaved people. Um, so, um, for the most part, enslaved people freed themselves on the basis of their legal mm -hmm. right to liberty through the proclamation when Union armies were near to which they could attach themselves. And if we could go back to the drawing for a minute, I'll, I'll, um, I'll tell the story, which I'm slow in getting to, but I wanted to set the stage. And also keep in mind the culture of the day is that these artists are attached to Union armies covering the action, or usually covering camp life, because it's not a great idea to look down at a sketchbook while shells are burning. So they did scenes in camp. And one day, uh, during the siege of Vicksburg, which was also featured in the last, uh, last episode of the Grant miniseries, um, and this detail was not shown, as Grant is besieging uh, the city of Vicksburg on the Mississippi River for several months, more and more African Americans in the region realize that Grant, that there is a bombardment and the Union Army is near, so they flee their plantations and attach themselves to Grant's army. And that's really how their dream of emancipation came true. And this day that Frederick Shell captured, a bunch of African Americans straggled into Grant's army at Vicksburg. What was remarkable about, about them? Until a day before, they were technically owned by Jefferson Davis at his Briarfield plantation a few miles away. Little by little, they had been peeling off from the plantation. But this group was captured by Shell as they marched into the army, now technically free. Not only were they legally free, according to the proclamation, but they had freed themselves under its and their families safe. And here you see them to the left of that uh, figure on horseback as other soldiers look on, uh, straggling into camp. By the way, I've always thought that, that uh, the, sold, the officer who is sort of leaning on a tree on the right-hand side is, I don't know, a little bit, he looks a, a little too much like Ulysses S. Grant uh, <laughs> as he looked at his field cap. To, to It's too much of a coincidence. So maybe Shell put that in as a little joke, uh, an inside joke. But here they are. And by the way, when Jefferson Davis heard about this, he was furious. Why would my people leave the comforts of that wonderful plantation life that I provided for them where they could labor seven days a week for no pay? And that was the, it's just an astonishing moment in the history of the Civil War. Uh, could we and see the images year, of... Uh, uh, Davis Sorry. and Grant, actually. Yeah. 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 It's See, just one a, year a from the time of the petition. Yeah, here's Grant um, leaning on a tree. I, I guess. With the and, hat, uh, right? To the right is <laughs> exactly. with that hat, right? Um, he was an informal fellow. Uh, and there's Jefferson Davis, who was not an informal <laughs> fellow, but had uh, abandoned his plantation for, quote, unquote, public service. To, to function as the president of the Confederacy. Um, and again, he believed that the slaves had no legal right to, uh, to their freedom, and uh, he expected still that he, the Confederacy would, would win independence and he would petition for ownership. But as we know, uh, that's not what happened. A few days after that incident in the drawing, um, maybe we can look next at the, uh, at the newspaper version of it. Yes. Uh, which is, there it is. So we have essentially the, the adaptation of the drawing into a uh, woodcut engraving for uh, Leslie's paper, August of 1863. Right. And it earned a and, sidebar of coverage, but not a big story, as you say. Yeah, how, and are there substantial differences between this woodcut version and the sketch? Well, I think it's sort of a normal adaptation for the day. The sketches tended to be rather rough, um, and the uh, the engraver the, the engravers back in New York cleaned them up 
uh, a little bit. They added details. I think what's lost here is uh, the, the depictions of the African Americans are a little more caricatured. Um, and, you know, as a fan of Impressionism, I like the I like the original because of that, you know, dashed off impressionistic feeling of movement. This is a little more static, but it has the virtue of uh, being uh, adapted so that tens of thousands of readers could marvel at this remarkable incident. Uh, otherwise, Shell's drawings remained um, his private property. Uh, but again, remarkably, Somehow, all of those New York Illustrated drawings came into the collection of the New York Historical Society at one point. So uh, the, the society has a trove of these original drawings. Truly, there is an embarrassment of riches in our collection. So, well, we're not. Uh, that. Yeah. We're, we're, we're fine. No. <laughs> uh, we have one last image that, that just rounds out this um, narrative. And by the way, please keep your uh, questions coming. We'll uh, get to them in a minute. Uh, here is a recruitment poster uh, from 1863. Uh, beautiful colors, as a matter of fact. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? This is not one of our official uh, objects, but it, just, right. it helps uh, round out our story here. It's sort of the, we put it last because it's so wonderful. And, and the pictorial uh, analog, the illustration for the Douglas poster, this is also a recruiting, uh, the, the Douglas uh, Broadside. This is also a recruiting poster, Broadside. but it's a lot more vivid. Here are African American soldiers. Um, you know, I think the color is a little bit faded in some aspects of this print. It should be a little bluer, but uh, there they are, early African American recruits uh, posing with their white officer, and the message is clear: Come and join this great effort, fight for your freedom, and be part of the the story, not only of reunion but of Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So uh, we have time now for some questions. And uh, the first is, did Lincoln ever see Douglas's newspaper piece? And if so, what was his reaction, Lincoln's reaction? So um, we have no evidence that Lincoln subscribed to Douglas's month. Um, you, you know, in those days, uh, having a subscription to an abolitionist newspaper, much less an abolitionist newspaper published by an African-American was like, uh, you know, akin to uh, subscribing to pornography by mail. I'm not equating them, but the reaction would have been one of shock. So Lincoln, as far as I know, um, unless he saw newspapers that were subscribed to by his rather liberal law partner back in Illinois, William Herndon, did not see the Liberator, the Garrison paper, did not see uh, Douglas's papers in their various names, the North Star. But he surely knew what Douglas was writing. And he surely knew that Douglas called him a slave catcher, attacked his first inaugural address, uh, attacked him for not, and he pushed him. You know, he was one of those who was nudging him along. But, uh, you know, did he, did he read the newspaper <laughs> that we know of for sure? No. Uh, next question. Since most or many slaves were not permitted to learn to read, was Frederick Douglass's broadside read by a few and then the word spread? Or uh, how, how was the word kind of disseminated? So that's a great question. Um, I would say that Men of Color to Arms was um, aimed at free African Americans, literate free African Americans in the North and in the border states uh, who could read. And, um, uh, and probably were among the subscribers to Douglas's monthly. So um, I, I have always assumed that the more uh, vivid uh, uh, pictorial recruiting poster, uh, Come and Join His Brothers, is meant for those who perhaps had more trouble with letters or, as you point out, Val, uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, the, the right to learn to read or write for generations by, by, by their white owners. But, you know, it, it, this question, which I hope I've answered, answered as well as I can, cuts to one of the great mysteries of Civil War communications. We talked a little bit about pictorial newspapers and about who reads them, uh, who reads regular newspapers. But um, 
one of the enduring mysteries is the message of emancipation and how it got to so many people of color uh, who were being held in the captivity of slavery uh, through the first two years of the war. One of the things Lincoln did is arm soldiers with little mini versions of the Emancipation Proclamation. And as the Union soldiers marched from town to town, city to city, farm to farm to plantation to plantation, they would knock on the door and say to the owners, here, yeah, we've got this. Your people, as they were called, are free. They can follow us. They can go where they want. And that's in part how the words But one of the great mysteries still remains the network of communication that was established among African Americans, even in rural areas. And there have been all sorts of legends about it. Was it messaging on quilts that were hung up? Was it, was it anything as um, you know, mysterious as drum beats or music? We just don't know. It's an oral tradition, and uh, and we'll never know it. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, here's a question. Uh, could you just clarify when the siege of Vicksburg took place? Yes. The siege of Vicksburg is May and June of 1863. Um, uh, we, we did not show tonight, although we do have it in the book, uh, a sketch called Cave Life in Vicksburg. The siege was so prolonged that the, the, the residents of Vicksburg were literally driven underground. They, they had to stay in caves, um, man-made caves, uh, to protect themselves from the constant shelling. So every minute or less than a minute, there was another artillery burst. And, the, and these shells would hit the streets and dance along the streets until they exploded. It was fearful. It was like the London Blitz, but constant. Um, and, uh, is that the object too that's on wallpaper? Uh, I seem to recall it. Was, no, that's uh, another no, one. That's it was I'm a, sorry. <laughs> no, the newspapers ran out of paper, so they began uh, uh, publishing on wallpaper rolls because there wasn't much redecorating going on in Vicksburg, so there was a lot of <laughs> wallpaper. And the last edition, so anyway, Grant, they finally surrender um, on July 3rd, 1863. Uh, same day as the Union wins the Battle of Gettysburg. So it's a glorious July 4th in, in the North and in Washington, D.C. But Grant's troops march in. And, you know, every army has uh, uh, soldiers who had various occupations before the war. And there must have been printers and typesetters because they went in and reset the one of the stories in the last edition of this Vicksburg newspaper on wallpaper saying Grant is in town. So um, it's a joint effort. And uh, yeah, there was, uh, so again, the siege ends uh, July 3rd and 4th, and the Union Army takes this almost impregnable hilltop city that had held out really for longer than they should have because both the garrison and the civilians were eating rats at that point, if they could find them. Uh, here's a very very interesting question. What was the relationship like between Jewish and black soldiers? Were they kindred spirits or not? Um, well, it depended on uh, where the Jewish soldiers came from. Um, it, uh, there, there was no um, uniform Jewish viewpoint in the Civil War. Um, perhaps some of us would like to think so in retrospect, but there were many uh, scholars and rabbis in the South who argued for the biblical justification for slavery and um, uh, opposed Lincoln and joined in the general criticism of Lincoln, even at the same time that there was uh, blatant anti-Semitism in the South and the North and the victimization, blaming of the Jews for all sorts of shortages, claims that Jews were you know, preying on deprivation to make money. But there is no uniform. Uh, Jewish soldiers were just as likely to be uh, bigoted or worried about African-American troops as, as white soldiers were. Uh, you know, there, there aren't that many heroic stories in this moment when African-American soldiers are, are allowed to join up. We have records of many soldiers who said... Um, I'm, not, I'm going home. I'm, I'm, I'm going to you know, just give up. I'm going to abandon ship or, or camp. 
and there were those who did. I think that the turning point for Jewish and Christian white soldiers as they regarded African-American troops was when they proved they could fight, when they proved they would fight just as hard or harder than white troops, when they proved their, their extraordinary courage at Fort Wagner in Milliken's Bend, when they were subject to atrocities by, at Fort Pillow by General Forrest, who had soldiers executed after, they were surre after they'd surrendered. So, you know, they say that no one is a bigot in a foxhole. Um, you depend on the next person, regardless of race or creed. And I think that's what happened in the Civil War. Uh, here's another question back to uh, Douglas and uh, Lincoln, uh, Frederick Douglas. Um, did Lincoln have high regard for his, for Douglas's intellect? Um, oh, I think he came to. Uh, uh, again, he had read Douglas. Do you know that it, before the war, people who visited Niagara Falls, tourists, would often take an excursion to Rochester to see Frederick Douglass because there were white people who did not believe that there was a, an African American who ran a newspaper, who wrote editorials. So he was kind of a tourist attraction himself to prove that he was actually a functioning intellect. So Lincoln had heard of him for sure. And when he made his way to the White House for their first visit, Douglas comes into the office and says, um, I'm Frederick Douglass. And Lincoln says, I know who you are. Um, and that's a little chilling, but Douglas writes a wonderful story about how Lincoln unfolded himself from a low chair. I mean, all chairs were low for someone who's tall as Lincoln, and towered over him. But never in any of their meetings, he said, treated him in any um, way that that suggested there was a difference of color. Uh, and Douglas always reckoned that it was because they had both risen from poverty and obscurity, and Lincoln felt a um, common bond with Douglas. So one, one thing Lincoln did... Um, part of the story we didn't tell, is he entrusted Douglas to map out a plan to liberate as many African Americans as possible at the end of 1864, thinking that he might lose the real, uh, the, his election campaign for a second term, and therefore the Democrats would abrogate the executive order and just say no more emancipation. And Douglas produced a dazzling detailed plan uh, of creating an army of African Americans to go into the dangerous Confederacy and, you know, convey the message that they were legally free there. Um, so Lincoln did respect his abilities. Of, uh, and one quick story, after his second inaugural, Douglas kind of breaks into the White House reception. He has to force his way in. And uh, Lincoln is on a receiving line, sees him, and he says, there is my friend Douglas. Douglas, there is no man whose opinion I value more than yours. What did you think of my inaugural address? I mean, enough about Douglas. No, I'm talking about me, but, but Douglas says to him, I, I, I think it was a sacred effort. Now, Lincoln announces that he's his friend in front of an all-white group, asks him to break the receiving line and convey his opinion of his most important speech. So that suggests what Lincoln thought of his intellect. Sure. It certainly does. Um, related to this, um, uh, there is a question about African American uh, Union recruits. Were they paid the same amount uh, that white soldiers were uh, receiving? So not at first. Lincoln designed a system um, to pay them less and again to require them to buy their own uniforms, unlike white soldiers, because he was fearful, ever fearful, you know, in those days about moving too quickly. He was fearful that there would be mass abandonment um, uh, of, of, by, the, by the white military if African Americans were introduced into the service. And even as Douglas implored him to change that unfair pay scale, uh, Lincoln told him it would take a little time until prejudices were overcome. And so eventually they did get the same pay. But, and by the way, there were a, a number of of soldiers, of those who remember the details of the movie Glory, a number of black soldiers, as much as they needed their salary, as 
much as they needed to send it home to the support of their families, as white people did. They didn't take their salary. They kept their salary warrant as a protest, um, which was a pretty um, nervy thing to do and a tough thing to do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back to Douglas again. Um, in the 1876 statue, uh, dedication, uh, Douglas said Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president, but was also emphatically the white man's president. Uh, did Douglas think Lincoln did enough? Um, well, it, let me just correct the, the, the foundation of the question there. In 1865, at Cooper Union, Douglas says Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president. Uh, so 11 years later, on the anniversary of the assassination, he unveils a statue of Abraham Lincoln and says he was predominantly the white man's president. But he adds, and you know, he's had 11 years to think, and uh, uh, the, the foundations of Reconstruction and black rights are crumbling now before Douglas's eyes in the deal um, about to crumble. But it's really hard to maintain black rights in the former Confederacy. And he says that Lincoln was predominantly the white man's president, but uh, he may have seemed cool and indifferent at the time. But compared to the vast majority of his white brethren, he was radical, fierce, and determined. So it was a very mixed message, uh, easily... I mean, I think the greatest speech ever given about Abraham Lincoln, and one worth reading and, and rereading because it's so nuanced. I mean, basically, he is. Uh, the other thing that makes it so challenging is he's unveiling a statue that is, by today's standards, politically incorrect. It shows a kneeling slave rising uh, through the beneficence of Abraham Lincoln. It's clearly a great emancipator image, which was the thing in the. 19th century. And um, it may look politically incorrect today, but it was funded, paid for um, exclusively by free African Americans, by pennies. Uh, so it's just everything is complicated, and that message is complicated. Absolutely. Um, one uh, last uh, kind of your opinion kind of question. What do you okay. think of Grant uh, on the History Channel right now? Okay. Um, I think it's a little simplistic. Uh, I love seeing my friend Ron Chernow. Um, I wish I saw more, more of him. And there are some very good historians on the show, Joan Waugh and, and, and others. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, in some areas it's a little simplistic. Uh, we're up, uh, as I speak, we're, you know, at the beginning of 1864, mid-1864, actually. And where is order number 11, speaking of... Uh, the status of Jews in the United States. Grant had issued an order banning Jews from the Western theater of the war, and sort of instituting a pogrom. Jews from Paducah had to migrate out of town before Lincoln overturned the order. So, you know, um, uh, I think the actor playing Grant is very good. The actor playing Lincoln? Aye, that's another story. <laughs> As the Jews of the day said when they saw this Lincoln, oi. Oi. <laughs> well, on that very happy note, I see we're out of time. And I want to thank you, Harold Holzer, for being such a terrific partner in tonight's program and in the whole series. Uh, and thank all of you out there for watching this evening, for your attention, your questions, and your membership support. We do value you, New York Historical, and are so happy to present uh, these programs to you. So we look forward to uh, seeing you back here a week from tonight uh, when we move from the, these pre-war stirrings to uh, more on the war itself. And until then, thank you and good night. Good night.